Good evening and welcome to the ministry. I am Archbishop Dracul, and alongside me is Father Avram. Our creed is to inspire our parishioners with reflections on the Nintendo Entertainment System. Tonight we are reflecting on Deadly Towers, which was co-developed by Lennar and Tamtex for IRM. It was released in North America in September of 1987 by Broderbund Software. This partnership between IREM and Broderbund was also responsible for publishing games like Spelunker and Guardian Legend. Tonight, our visiting deacon is Jeffrey Gabor. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me. You're most welcome. A Testament to the Creators Junichi Mizutari Game and Character Design Other works include the 1985 arcade port Tower of Druaga for the Famicom. I have to say, I played this game, and while I understand its influence to, like, dungeon crawlers everywhere... I found it to not hold up in the least bit. It is, it makes, it kind of makes sense. Um, it's a sloppy g- game. Given the frustration, the frustration factor is really high on that game. So, you know, I'm not, I'm really not surprised. Hmm. However, I don't think it was actually developed for a Western audience. Keep that in mind. Hmm. Hmm. That's a good perspective. Wise point, Deacon Gabor. R. Nagasu. Game Design and Programming Nagasu went on to create a 2D fighting game engine called Mugen in 1999 for the PC. I had never heard of this when I found it uh, when I was doing my research on the creators. I, I, I was a little bit floored. Apparently, it's like a fighting... Well, it's a fighting game engine, as I said, but it's people can like create their own content... They can create their own characters even and like push them to the platform. And um, it, it, it kind of became like a, not a cult classic, but that type of feel like among its followers. So um, you have all sorts of different fighters and characters in this fighting game. It's, it's kind of an interesting thing, uh, but uh, I'd never heard of it before uh, doing this research. Yeah, I saw... Um... I saw that it support it was supported by Windows and Linux, and I, I'm is it is it still around? I I don't really know. I didn't download it or play it. I just kind of read about it. Our last creator of mention is Yoshinobu Kasukawa, the composer. Kasukawa was also the composer for the 1987 Zombie Hunter, and also potentially the composer. For the 1989 Major League, both of which were released for the Famicom. And it's interesting to note that from what I can gather, with very little information I've been able to find about Major League is that it's based on the movie with uh, the wacky Sheen guy. I forget his name. Charlie uh, Sheen. Okay. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Yeah. Um, it also doesn't have a very good soundtrack. Uh, no, the soundtrack is abhorrent. Maybe he maybe it was an uncredited work, which is why he's only potentially the composer. I could not find any confirmation that that was true. It was just kind of a big question mark. So, very interesting stuff. So, marketing. This game was released in 1987, which was pre-internet and pre-Nintendo Power even. And the only piece of marketing we could find was a poster. The the poster looks very much like it belongs in a... uh, you know, a video store or a, or a toy store of some kind or another. It's a, it's a Broderbund poster. So it actually advertises for five games, 
Load Runner, Spelunker, Raid on Bungling Bay, Deadly Towers, and Schoon are all on this poster. I was at the game store today, and good God, Schoon is... is They're asking $300 for it. It's crazy. Yeah, prices have definitely skyrocketed for games recently. And I mean, it's it's it's, it's a fun little shooter. It's charming. I just don't... I don't know. It's one of those things where, like, do I really want to spend three hundred dollars on this game? Yeah, yeah. but it is. It's very. It's a very interesting note that, in spite of the lack of marketing, how much of an actual, uh, you know, commercial success Deadly Towers was. It's kind of uncanny. Uh, it seems like every player out there that had a Nintendo somehow managed to find this game in their collection, which is why it's one of the reasons why it's so cheap Yeah, today is because it's just there's so many of them. Yeah, I feel like in that first year, first couple years, there weren't that many games to actually like pick and choose from. So when you saw the poster and saw what it looked like, it looked like it was going to be like a sequel or, or a you know, like Legend of Zelda. Uh, so I think people wanted to give it a chance. I certainly did. Uh, I saw that cover, uh, and there were actually even at the time. It's important to put in in reflection. Not only was there not really Nintendo Power or the internet, even like the rental industry wasn't really quite there yet for video games. There was a there was a handful of people that were uh, maybe starting to build up and renting a game, which was unique. But people just were end up like, oh, I guess I'm gonna buy it. <laughs> that was your option. Yeah, and and you're a hundred percent correct. Like the 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 video stores were the, the the concept of even renting VHS tapes, never mind video games, was still extremely new. Let us discuss the seven categories for which we execute judgment on Deadly Towers. Category one is the narrative. A reading from the Deadly Towers story screen. This is an old, old story from the Stone and Copper Ages when there lived men and devils. As the coming of age ceremony approached, Prince Meyer grew nervous, for the day would be a memorable time in which he would succeed the throne of the kingdom of Wilner. In his worrying about the kingdom of the future, he took himself over by the lake near the castle to think. Suddenly, reflecting the moonlight, a shadow arose from the lake. As the prince stared at it, it gradually turned into a man. Prince Meyer, light of virtue, the man's voice rose out. It is time for you to light up the darkness. Rubis, the horrid devil of darkness, is plotting to extend his power over your kingdom. He is viciously scheming to build a castle on the northern mountain, to ring magic bells, to lure monsters out at your defenses, and to invade the kingdom in a single stroke. If you wish to be forever at peace in the kingdom of Wilner, You must journey to the northern mountain and burn down the seven bell towers in the devil's castle with the sacred flame. Prince Meyer, only you can accomplish this feat. Go to the mountain, burn down the seven towers, defend the kingdom against the devil. With that, the shadow grew mistier, lost its shape, and finally disappeared, leaving the beautiful lake as though untouched. Could it be an oracle? Prince Meyer murmured. He fell deep into thought for a moment, but immediately regained his senses. He had remembered the legend of Khan. The legend said that at the time when God's image appears from the lake, a great power will be given to a young man to defeat the devil of darkness and restore peace to the kingdom. Hurrying back to the castle, the prince told the king of the strange event. The king, 
believing in the truth of the matter, excitedly ordered Prince Meyer to destroy Rubis and all his dark ways. This is a reading from the Deadly Towers story screen. I think it's important to mention that for those who haven't played the game, that if you let the title screen run, a scrolling text of this story will actually start showing up on the screen, and it's kind of like Star Wars style. And, and it's it had, quite long. It, it's, <laughs> I would say it's, it's long. It's it's probably one of the longest, most robust and intriguing stories for uh, for the time. Even even on the NES in the very beginning, we were used to like single screen sort of arcadey games. That kind of was mm-hmm. a was like a, 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 a continuation of from the Atari. I would say this is probably the longest story on the NES. I would bet some money on that. Actually, I uh, yeah, I, I think I'm with you. I I can't think of any others that are longer off the top of my head. Yeah. I mean, I'm reading, like, I'm comparing it to The Legend of Zelda, right? Again, I mean, I can sum it up, and it's a quarter (laughs) of the size. Yeah, many years ago, Prince Darkness Ganon stole one of the Triforce with power. Princess Zelda had one of the Triforce with wisdom. She divided it into eight units to hide it from Ganon before she was captured. Go find the eight units, Link, to save her. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, that's vastly, uh, vastly more terse. However, I think it sets the tone for the ge- for the game quite well, and I think that's why I kept going back to it all these years. Uh, I was intrigued. It was it was a mis- it was mysterious, you know. And we'll go we'll get into more of that later. But like, so at this point, you you see that that awesome looking poster. You pick up the game, you turn it on, and you get that story. How pumped are you? True. Arguably with one of the best songs on the soundtrack. And that song, to me anyway, when I was a kid, was creepy and dark as hell. Proceed to category two, audio. I found the soundtrack in this game, with the exception of the story screen, to be painful and repetitive. Now, granted, I do want to say that it had some flavor, but I feel like every single room in the game, in one shape, or form or another was basically the same song with a different twist on it. And that, that was just, it gets really annoying really fast because of that. There are a few decent tracks on it. Uh, I, but for the most part, I agree. I also, I think what killed it for me was the um, the implementation of the audio. So, like, I don't like. Let's, so, there's always been this issue where whenever you leave a room or a screen, the the, the audio stops and then it start the audio starts over again, like from the beginning of the track. So it got extremely repetitive. I did download a patch that claimed to fix this. And while, yes, when you left the room and entered the next room, it picked up from, up from where you were before, but there's still that pause in between rooms. So it'd be like, ding, 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 ding. And then, <laughs> ding, 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 ding. You know what I mean? It was, it was... It was disappointing because I thought that they maybe were, were able to work around that, but um, I guess that's that's something that I, I don't know why 
That is, Legend of Zelda doesn't do that. It's like as the screen is loading, the music is still going. Yeah. I, I will say I found it to at least be catchy. At least that. So, like, p- playing it years ago, hearing it again, it has, like, vibes of nostalgia. So it does get it in your ear a little bit to at least uh, tickle you years later. I do agree with that. It is absolutely catchy. It's it, There are a lot of Nintendo songs, I believe, that are just, like, they're, they're not memorable at all. Like, th- th- there are. There exist a lot of Nintendo songs where you're like, ah, I don't know if I can really recall that song. But this song, and maybe just by nature of it being super repetitive, too. Like, there is that. Mm-hmm. But this song, like, you can recall no problem. Uh, it, so it does kind of stick with you. We, we should probably mention the sound effects. And my my biggest gripe with the sound effects was that whenever you pick something up, it sounds like you did something wrong. Mm-hmm. Yep. It sounds like a classic uh, 80s game show buzzer. You got something yeah. wrong. Yeah. Yeah, well, like when you went go to a shop and buy an item, and you the, the minute you buy it, it goes... Burr. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. like, oh, I guess that was the wrong item. Basically, the, the game just burps in your face, essentially. And it's like, okay... Uh, maybe I wasn't supposed to pick that up. And then you realize, oh, wait, uh, that's a good item. And then it gets confusing. They definitely didn't subscribe to the tropes of e- even arcade games, like obviously, or, or anything. I don't, I don't know why they chose that sound, but it was a poor choice. proceed to category three which is gameplay a reading from the deadly towers manual your objective is to reach the seven towers each tower has one bell which should be burnt by the holy flame the bells are at the top of the towers after burning all the bells you'll be able to open the entrance to the king of the devil's room when you climb to the top of each tower you have to fight the guardian of the bell. If you win, climb the ladder and get the bell. When you get the bell, go back to the underground and touch the holy flame. The bell will be thrown into the fire and the tower will burn. If you fall off a broken edge or over a cliff, or if the hit points dwindle to zero, your quest is over. When you kill enemies, sometimes they leave money or hearts. A heart will give you hit points. Money helps you buy items. Don't forget to collect the circle hearts. These increase your maximum hit points to up to 299. An item can be picked up while wandering or can be bought at shops which are hidden in certain areas. Sometimes an invisible entrance will take you to a parallel world. There will be only one exit to the world where you came from. Search all areas of the castle carefully to find the parallel worlds. Same as the parallel worlds, the entrances to the underground dungeons are invisible. Each dungeon consists of about 200 rooms for each room, and each room has enemies. A few rooms in the dungeon have a magical pattern on the floor, which may be the entrance to a shop, the exit of the dungeon, or makes a good map marker. Secret rooms are hidden throughout the tower and castle. Search every area by walking around the entire screen in each area. When the game ends, write down the password displayed on the screen. To get a new password, you have to end the game by dying. When you wish to continue your game after you quit, enter your password in the password entry screen to start the game. A reading from the Deadly Towers manual. I have... No redeeming qualities to report about the gameplay of this of <laughs> Deadly Towers. None. Harsh words. And I have a laundry list of complaints. 
Well, then maybe I can speak to some of the pros. Then please do. I'll say it's easy to understand from the very start what the controls are, what your weapons are. You may not know exactly where to go, but you have an immediate control over the character and how to just navigate. There is an RPG aspect to the leveling. Like you can level the, you know, uh, Prince Meyer. That's fun to do. You get a little bit more powerful. You get a little bit better. So at least it entices you to keep playing because you feel like you can actually progress. Um, and I will say it's super ambitious, uh, the the gameplay. Like with the parallel worlds, the dungeons, trying to find back to the real world. It's all these hidden things. It just makes it mysterious. Uh, and in that way, it's an intriguing uh, game that it ends up being a little fun in that way. Do you have any any cons you would like to bring up in your experience with the gameplay? How much time do we have? Oh, boy. Well, then let it, let us allow uh, Archbishop Dracul to uh, to speak his mind. Please. While Deacon Gabor brings up some very excellent points that I actually agree with and kind of rescinded my last comment. I will actually say, though, the good definitely does not outweigh the bad. Like there, there are it, one of the thing, one of the most frustrating aspects of this game is that you get thrown back when you get hit. Now that might not seem like a big deal, but like in the very beginning of the game, you're incredibly weak and being thrown back means that you could bump into something else. Therefore throwing you back again potentially throwing you in into the previous room you were in. And because they spawn enemies at the entrances for some reason to these rooms in a lot of instances, you could get thrown back yet again. And this is especially frustrating in the dungeons. Yeah, I've had it happen to where I would enter a room. There was an enemy spawned right where I walked in. I got hit got sent back, got hit by the enemy there, got sent back down, hit by another one, sent back out of the second room, and literally had a chain reaction of going from room to room until I died. And I had nothing, there was nothing I could possibly do. Not, not to mention, also, in the castles, there's these little jagged edges to the walkway. Those are considered cliffs, and if you, and, and you can fall off the castle and die. It's not uncommon for you to be walking, and then all of a sudden, these little terrible creatures or entities just attack you with no warning, and they're going extremely fast, and your reaction time in the very beginning of the game is very slow. So, you would most likely, if you were anywhere near a cliff, you wouldn't go backwards. You would go down the cliff. You wouldn't go the opposite direction of where you got hit, which was a very bizarre choice in my opinion. The combat mechanic only allows one sword to spawn on the screen at any any given time. Uh, This paired with how slow your sword is at the start of the game makes, makes the start of the game unrealistically difficult almost. The concept or the best way to defeat an enemy was to get right up against the enemy and sp- and like spam the button, the attack button. And what would happen is because the close proximity of the enemy, it would allow you to sort of do a turbo shot. Later in the game, a so-called power-up is called the parallel shot. And while on while it might make sense that it would be a power-up for the bigger enemies, there really aren't that many enemies that were the size of the two swords coming, getting shot out. So most of them were too small, which would end up having an effect of you get, you you hit it with one sword and you have to wait for the other sword that missed it to leave the screen before you could shoot again, making the, the strategy of going up against a character and spamming the button a moot point it doesn't work at that point so 
there was there was a lot of a lot of things like that that were really frustrating. Uh, the the dungeons felt like an afterthought. Um, they they didn't feel as developed as um, as the rest of the game. The dungeons entrances have no visual representation, so you're literally if you don't know where you're going, you could literally be walking and suddenly the screen goes ding, and then, <laughs> then you're in a dungeon. And uh, you're like, oh no, what is it? Where am I? Where? What is this? And pro- and probably the worst part about that. How do I get out? How do you get out? Because you can't exit the same way you enter. <laughs> well, I'm sure that there must be a map you get, right? Uh, well, there was only one map on um in the man in the manual. And and but somebody somebody somehow and I can't remember what year it was. Somebody somehow mapped out every single dungeon. Now, that may not seem like a big deal. But given the repetitive nature of each room, and the fact that they actually loop the dungeons in certain points. So, like, if let's say you go, if you go all the way to the right, it won't stop. It'll just loop back to all the way to the, to the leftmost room on the other side. I have no idea how that person mapped out those dungeons with with the looping mechanic, and I have no idea. It's it, it, it's daunting to me. Like I, I, I I'm, I'm I'm like I'm, I'm impressed. You know, <laughs> it's, just, it's crazy. And then my last thing. I'm sorry. I've been talking a lot. I'll let you guys talk after this. But the last thing I want to say is that there are, like, mission-critical items hidden in these parallel worlds or secret rooms in the towers. Now, yes, it's, it's you should go and find them, right? But if you didn't know, like, back then, in the context of being back then, if you didn't know that you needed, the that, like, the best armor in the game was in these parallel dimensions or secret rooms in a tower and you go up the tower you kill the boss you get the bell and you leave the tower and end up once you leave the the walkway and end up back in like the tower hub so to speak the entrance is gone essentially soft locking the game making it impossible like literally and probably literally impossible to beat it without those items because you can't go back and get them so, uh, as for me, I, I I remember playing this game as a kid and being extremely frustrated with it because I didn't read the manual, of course, and I didn't really get into the story. I just thought it was a cool Zelda-like game. As Deacon Gabor has mentioned, it was definitely a selling point to try and sell it as like a kind of Zelda clone based on the screenshots, right? So I was kind of expecting that. Obviously, it wasn't that, and I'd get really frustrated. (laughs) That being said, coming back to it as an adult was a different experience for me. Um, I really got into the story, really got into reading the manual, looking at all the hints in the manual, and as an adult, appreciating these types of games now, uh, from a modern perspective, looking back at these types of games and appreciating them for what they are, it was a totally different experience. Now, that being said, this game is virtually unplayable without a walkthrough. Unless you have countless hours to walk over every inch of the screen as suggested by the manual, unless you have countless hours to map out every single dungeon, um, or you just have dumb luck to find stuff uncannily, um, you're going to have a really hard time with this game. It's, it, you need a walkthrough. And I used a walkthrough to play this game. Um, And it was an enjoyable experience once I had that walkthrough. The game was still difficult. The game was still seemingly impossible in places. But at the end of the day, it was achievable. It was finishable. I beat this game. I think all three of us beat this game, in fact, uh, when we played it for this this reflection. And um, 
what was a turning point for me in regards to enjoyment actually was when I realized that this was an early day roguelike. Um, so, the, as, as you guys know, roguelike derives from the 1980 game Rogue, where you're basically doing the same thing. You kind of go and you build up stuff and you die and you lose stuff and there's some sort of like meta character development right throughout so that you get better and better as you keep dying and playing. So, as soon as I realized that, oh wait, when I actually get that armor, when I actually get that sword, I get to keep it forever. That changed the face of the game for me. Suddenly dying didn't become as scary and I would actually my goal would be just to survive just long enough to get that next piece of armor. And then once I did, I felt safe. I'd actually die a couple of times just so I could get the password in case the game crashed or something like that. And that was a really enjoyable challenge for me. So, but that being said, um, all of the flaws that Archbishop Dracul has mentioned, I echo entirely. I don't understand how people have mapped out dungeons in spite of the fact of it being looped other than recognizing features and saying, oh, this must be a loop because I already mapped it like up here. Um, so I, I don't I don't really know how um, how people have done it. Uh, the other thing that was really, really aggravating to me was trying to figure out how to end the game. What I mean by that is I was playing through and there was a point where I actually had to jump back to one of my previous like two passwords ago uh, points because I realized I had set myself up for failure because I burnt down or I didn't actually burn down the tower, but I but I had taken the bell from a tower that had something in it that I needed to complete the game. And there was no going back because as soon as you grab that bell and you leave the tower, you're not going back in there. The game doesn't allow you to do that. That is such a major flaw um, that I echo uh, what Archbishop Dracul has mentioned in there. Um, I don't think there's anything left to be said other than that for me. I I was just going to mention some more like of the technical gameplay stuff that bothered me like right from the beginning the dungeons you get thrown into a room you're gonna get hit like you mentioned but also say you don't get hit and you're like i'm gonna take this little dragon guy on you're you're sitting above it and you assume like any other like slightly top down perspective that your character can kind of walk behind things or has a little bit of room there that doesn't exist like you barely get inside this collision box and you go flying so that that three quarter down perspective doesn't really make sense and it also the rules of that are all over the map sometimes one character oh and the the uh the idea that like your sword can sometimes pause the enemies right like it's like okay once i hit them it'll stun them and then they'll stay in place and i'll finish them off no rhyme or reason so half the time the characters don't actually get stunned and they just keep on walking, making it super difficult to manage the rooms when there's five or six of these enemies on the screen. And then inexplicably, you start so weak and then the enemy's HP is so high. You mentioned like you run up to, uh, you know, an enemy and you start spamming. It's like you are literally spamming like 20 swords into a little blobby circle guy just to get him dead <laughs> it's it's crazy mm-hmm. um, i do want to mention something that you said about uh the, without rhyme or reason they don't stop walking there's certain enemies that are actually two parts they have a head and a body and if you hit them in the head they don't stop walking but if you hit them in the body they do is that is so as is, just an <laughs> interesting it, choice uh, sure. to make. yeah it's not it's not a great choice but i discovered that as well and i was like what's going on here and then i realized oh i'm hitting them in the head and they're, they're they keep going so yeah very interesting design choices that were, were not, not yeah good. <laughs> and then and then like even even the the idea that you're not actually you, you climb at one point should you be so lucky get to the point where you're actually climbing ladders even though it's like a weird down perspective, all of a sudden the perspective shifts. Very odd. But 
you can't shoot enemies while you're on. And they certainly come for you. Like, there are these ghosts in the parallel worlds and the towers. They're flying all over the place. As soon as you're climbing up a... I don't know how many uh, tiles up it is, like 12, 15 tile ladders, you're completely vulnerable unless you get hit. Should you get hit, all of a sudden you can use your sword for that brief iframe moment, which to me... Oh, on the ladder? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It for sure is a bug, not a feature. (laughs) Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely an exploitable bug, and thank God for it, because I would have died without it. (laughs) Right. (laughs) I was going to say a couple things before we move on. One of those things was that I noticed. uh, So just to just so people have an idea of how this of how the progression of the levels go. Um, You start off at the very base of the castle and you have to walk, climb your way up to different. Like, I think it's like seven or nine levels of the castle before you can actually enter what is called the cliff wall, which is essentially a hub for that leads to every single tower. Now, if you go into one of the, one of the, one of the caves that leads to the tower, before you get to the tower, you actually have to climb uh, a a section, which I'm not a hundred percent sure what it's called, but it's, it's, it's uh, diagonal stairs and you're like sort of ascending towards the tower during that section of the game, that is arguably some of the best background graphics in the game. Why do I, I agree? Why do I and arguably some of the best music in the game? Mm-hmm. Now, and one of the things that I want to bring up about that section that I found incredibly interesting is that when I was a kid, I remember the the labor of love it took just to get to that section of the game like how long how many times i died how like the frustration the anger just to get to that section of the game right nintendo of america had had very strict rules about things uh, about uh about how in order to uh to publish on their system, you had to abide by these very strict rules. One of which is you cannot use religious iconography in the game, in your game. I was climbing that section and noticed there were crucifix shaped windows. Now you may not think that's a big deal, but the interesting thing is that DuckTales, for instance, in the Transylvania level, in the Japanese version for the Famicom, had crucifixes on the coffin that Nintendo of America made Capcom take out. Which means either they didn't see it as a crucifix window, or they literally never got to that section of the game because it was so difficult. It's a <laughs> very inter- interesting <laughs> point. It, it's, up, yeah. it's up for interpretation. <laughs> Lastly, uh... I had I too used the walkthrough to talk about uh, the walkthroughs that Father Abram brought up, but I found it very hard to find one that either that either was complete or wasn't broken. And uh, I feel like it's a testament to how frustrating this game is to play. Yeah, the walkthroughs leave a little bit to be desired. Uh, I, I don't know if I, I also had to use a walkthrough. I, I think it would have been very enjoyable should I have unlimited time and could map out each one of the dungeons. I feel like getting the old graph paper out, it would have been satisfying and fun. Um, and back in the day when you only have so many games and you can spend a year playing the game, would have been cool. Don't have that luxury right now. Uh, but <laughs> one of those walkthroughs said that the parallel shot that you mentioned its flaws earlier was the best item in the game. So I was so excited to get it and start using it. I was like, what is going on? This thing is horrible. It's it is, worse. It, it is. I, I, I would say, I, w- I would literally say it is the worst power up on the NES that I've run. I, I, I actually <laughs> would have agreed with you until I revisited the fabled Ghosts and Goblins recently and picked up the torch. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know. 
I, I don't know because the torch doesn't change the strategy, right? It's you're still attacking with the I, parallel. Well, you're still attacking. I mean, I guess regardless no, of how slow you just you're attacking at literally. It's, yeah, it's because you're you're attacking at literally the same frequency that you are at the beginning of Deadly Towers because you have to let the flame burn out before you can throw another one. Yeah, it's still an attack. <laughs> but like, but but the parallel shot literally takes your strategy of attacking out of the game. Uh, yeah, no, I I agree. I I still I I still contend that it may not be the worst, but it is definitely in the top five worst power ups on the NES. And it, it is very difficult to get. So you're looking for a big reward. Hey, yeah, it's not that. There. That being said, the double shot is what you should go for. Right? There you go. That stay, that is a huge reward. Stay away yes. from the parallel shot. When I, when I was playing and I got the double shot, I was like, "Oh my god, it's so much better!" <laughs> it's like, mm-hmm. it's so, it was infinitely better. Oh, uh, and don't don't make the mistake of like, all right, well, I picked, I just happened to pick up the double shot first, maybe leave burn that tower then they pick up the parallel shot oh no i want to go get my double shot back nope that tower's gone yep yep leave leave the parallel shot in the bowels of hell (laughs) Mm -hmm. yes where it belongs Let us proceed to category four, the graphics. Aside from the dungeons, I really liked the background graphics. Mm-hmm. I, I, uh, I thought they were detailed and interesting and very mysterious. I also thought that the addition of like the character in the jail, mm-hmm. the little goblin in the jail was a nice slice of life sort of thing. Uh, which, which, by the way, it, you can kill him, but you'll lose all your money. And when I say we haven't discussed the fact that money, the currency in this game, is actually called Lutter. So I, I should probably bring that up now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I found the... I, so, yeah, I found the, the backgrounds in the castle, in the cliff wall, in the towers to be quite decent. Um... I, but I didn't find the enemies to be inspired at all. Uh, you fight things like blobs and flames and wind. You're this guy in a suit of armor, which doesn't look like the box art at all. Um, in fact, he, 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 he is modeled off of the Famicom box art, which was uh, a little bit more anime themed so that's why when you look at the cover and you turn on the game and you see this guy in this blue jumpsuit with horns you're like oh what what happened and uh but we'll get to the box art presentation in the next section but the graphics yeah i'm not i'm not uh i'm not i'm not a, a huge fan um i i think one of the things that that is that that i found most interesting where like the windows and like the the uh, the, the faces in the walls, you know, there is it's just interesting, mysterious, you know. I I would say that the graphics uh, for this game are are half inspired. Uh, I d- did not like the representation of Prince Meyer. It left much to be desired, and it was a stark contrast to the rest of the universe. Um, the dungeons were also uninspired. Uh, they all the rooms basically they just did palette changes uh, and used the same graphics over and over with different palette changes, and then either doors would be there or doors would not be there. 
Um, and then every once in a while you get like the same graphic on the floor where a map marker is, which may or may not be a shop hidden in the center of the map marker or the exit. Um, but yeah, the, uh, the, the enemies were half of them were bland, like single color type of representations. Um, and the other half, like the humanoid type characters, I thought were pretty well done. Um, there were some bosses that I thought were very, were very, uh, uh, uh I guess the right, uh, stale, <laughs> stupid. Um, and, but then there were other, there were others that were actually pretty cool. I really actually think that the best boss in the game is Great Wing, uh, visually. Um, that's all I have to offer. Hmm. What you don't like? What, you don't like Beat Plant? <laughs> it's a weird name. <laughs> at least, at least the the sprites were big, which was very unusual for the NES at the time. Like, even even Prince Meyer was, I think, two tiles high. Um, I mean, his animation was only two frames, which is rough. But it is still that was pretty cool to see um, such large sprites, and the the bosses were huge. Uh, unfortunately, I've, I also feel like that same thing. That your your character is a little bit larger than normal, and so are the enemies. Uh, however, for some reason, when you get into the dungeons, the vast majority of the visual real estate is taken up by walls, and you're you're left with a teeny tiny little play area to move around. Which, of course, then that's why we get the problem of knockback, being, walking into a room and instantly getting spawn killed. Uh, just because it's like half the real estate is just used to <laughs> decorate the walls. Very weird. Mm. Yeah, and, and you know that being thrown back through the through the rooms of the dungeons. I'll say it again: is so frustrating. And not only for the fact that you can't do anything about the, to anything to change your demise, but it's almost like the game is teasing you because you, it, the music resets on every entrance to a room. So it goes ding, ding. Ding, and then you die. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a little trick that I will mention in the hints and cheats section later. Remind me of it uh, that you can use to help get out of that. Okay. Let us proceed to category five, box art and presentation. A reading from the back of the box. You are young Prince Meyer, setting out to defend the ancient kingdom of Wilner. Rubus, king of the devils, has built a castle in the north and is preparing to invade your kingdom. Ringing magic bells, he is calling out an army of the most terrifying creatures known or unknown to man. To defeat Rubus, you must journey to his palace and burn down his seven bell towers. On your quest, you will collect weapons and armor to defend yourself against rats and prowlers, bats, snakes, and slime, demons, dragons, and more. You'll need every ounce of help you can get. Understatement of the year. For you are all that stands between your people and the forces of darkness. Game features include arcade action with role-playing game depth, state-of-the-art graphics and music. Special password system allows players to continue a game in progress. The reading from the back of the box. Can I just mention really quick here that there are absolutely, to my knowledge, no rats in this game? No rats. Rubus is ringing his magic bells and calling out an army of the most terrifying creatures known to man, like slime balls, wind, flames, <laughs> spheres, just spheres. Yep. Spheres. Yep. Spheres are of the devil. Blue and orange ones. And and ones that stack. Those are the worst. <laughs> but those are the ones that bear fruit, Father Avram. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> They provide the most lutter and hearts. <laughs> I'm sorry. So the art, the 
the box art. So just to, to reiterate, uh, my first experience with this game was going, what was when I walked into the video store and, and looked at the wall of games that were available. Now, back then, what they would do is they would line the wall with the actual boxes of the games. From a collector's point of view, these days, that's sacrilege, but that's beside the point. So you'd see, you get to actually like pick up the game and look at the cover and read the back. That's why we included the reading from the back of the box, because that was literally, that with the cover art was literally the only marketing that really existed for this game. Now, did they do a good job? I, I had never heard of the game before this. And the concept of like burning towers to kill evil monsters and like it sounded high adventure, like awesome, you know. And and the cover art was it, the cover art really captured the es- the essence of the story quite well. Um, it, a lot of atmosphere and like hellish overtones, and it was just it was very very intriguing. Yeah, I'd like to say that the 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 cover art to me was very reminiscent of like a more detailed saturday morning cartoon like these are the days that people are watching you know transformers and he-man and you know that kind of thing and it 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 almost looked kind of like oh yeah i, I yeah i'd love to be he-man you know um so it had that kind of vibe to it, and that was definitely one of the pulls for me to this box. What are your thoughts, Deke and Gabor? Well, the art was actually really cool. I, I was going to say it even if it had like a Lord of the Rings type vibe or a Ralph Bakshi type uh, animated movie where it felt like, a you know, this is for adults. This is like this is really cool stuff. Um, you know, it didn't it, the even though it was like more realistic type of a painting you know we've seen those kind of things go horribly wrong with like say Mega Man um, you know those kind of like box art where they're trying to like capture that kind of energy this is really cool like I think I, in terms of like the way the box art is presented at you, you can't do much better it was really cool no and like the, the and the attention to detail is fantastic if you look closely on the front of the box in the mountains you can see a castle with seven bell towers it's really cool I never noticed that before, actually. Let us proceed to category six, which is the fun factor. We talked about the how we used... Um, walkthroughs to play the game which from today's standards us being arguably full-grown adults you know so we don't have the luxury like Deacon Gabor said of just sitting around and and trying to figure this thing out like we did when we were kids so we did use a walkthrough and I found that once you pick up there's two things that that you pick up that like literally changed the game. Like it's almost like a light switch. When, and those two things are the hyper armor and the hyper gauntlet. When you get those two things, the game opens up like monumentally and actually becomes a pleasant experience, all things considered. Now, the, the downside of all of that is if you look at it from the context of being a 10 year old boy throwing this game in and trying to make sense of it, it wasn't fun to like literally walk around every grid square in the game just so you can find a dungeon or a shop, all things that should actually have, should have had visual representation in my opinion. Yeah, that was going to be my fun factor uh, review, pretty much, uh, pretty much, almost verbatim, 
with the uh, exception of saying, with the walkthrough, I enjoyed it. However, at face value, and considering my experience as a child with this game, it was not fun. You need to know the secrets. You need to know the secret handshake, really, in order to have fun. Quite honestly, though, with some small tweaks, it could have been fun. It could have been fun if they had done visual representation of stuff, gotten rid of the cliffs, and, you know, uh, didn't have looping dungeons with 200 rooms. I feel like the game could have been a lot of fun. And Father Abram actually started the process of picking apart the ROM and trying to figure out how to a make, redaction, how to make those little changes to make the game playable. I just thought I'd throw that in here. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's possible. They we'll get into it on the technical section next, but uh, it's it, it yeah, it's very complicated. Yeah, I, I will say I had fun playing it now uh, with the walkthrough. Like, I would actually recommend it for people that are into uh, older video games. Like, get the walkthrough; right? you can actually have a good time with it. Um, but I actually distinctly remember renting this game as a kid. Uh, I had a stomach ache, and I got a game to rent over the weekend. Uh, and uh, I rather I I remember sitting with my stomach ache over playing the game. <laughs> I didn't. I put it in two or three times, and that was it. I didn't, I, it was, it was almost immediate deaths. It was not understanding what the purpose of anything is. And it was a bait and switch of what I thought I was going to get. And then what was actually happening. So I had no fun. And that my lasting memory is that I took it back immediately. And my mom was upset that I didn't actually play the game that she spent her money on to rent. Uh, and actually this is, this is kind of a, it's totally anecdotal, but I do remember one of the flaws of renting games, um, especially games that had been out for a little while, unless the rental store was really on top of their stuff, you could rent games that you just had no manual for, like whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Um, you would get sent home maybe sometimes if you were lucky with like a laminated copy of the manual. And I feel like that was only in like the most like in the best of circumstances. Occasionally um, you would actually get a Xerox copy of the manual. Yeah. That was the most common. Yeah. 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 Renting was, was a strange practice, not to mention uh, again, going back to the rental store. And I know we've ridden this horse to death, but like the, the, it, it wasn't like blockbuster during this time. If you, a lot of people remember blockbuster and how it's like, Hey, you know what? I'm going to go rent this tonight. And you could quite literally go there and rent it. That wasn't the case during this time. You had to be extremely lucky to get the game you wanted because they most places only had one copy. Mm hmm. Yep. Let's proceed to category seven, which is technical. Like, I have no real cons, aside from maybe the bug that Deacon Gabor explained earlier, where when you're on the ladder, you can, like, shoot up and down, but you have to get hit first. Because I never knew that being young growing up. Playing recently, going up the ladder and being like, what in the hell? Why can't I shoot up or down? I don't know who made that decision, but that's a gameplay thing. Anyway, technically speaking, given the fact that throughout the castle, specifically the castle levels for some reason, you are inundated with enemies. More so, I think, than any other NES game I can remember, even though it was just like enemies were everywhere, which was usually what would trigger the slowdown in other games. So that, for me, is a pro. I also have uh, almost no cons uh, to um, the technical side of this because they actually did a lot of really impressive things uh, with this game. 
on a technical level. First of all, the game is massive. I don't know if it's the largest NES game in regards to number of screens. Well, I'll, I'll just interject and say that the retrospective that the Retronauts uh, did on this, they did like a, a five to seven minute video on YouTube. And they said that there is more screens in this game than Zelda first and second quest combined. It's crazy. Yeah. Uh, so, so the game is humongous. And, and uh, uh, you know, so they do a, a fantastic job at cramming all of this stuff. However, on a technical level, what they did was they also sacrificed the amount of room, obviously, that they were using for audio. Because we all know that the composer was actually capable of composing a full-length song, as we see in the story screen. However, it's just not that way throughout the game, right? So uh, I think they probably ended up sacrificing audio in order to make space for their massive world, which is mostly irrelevant. Like, Mm -hmm. most of the world is totally irrelevant. I have a theory that the game originally, like, the game was originally just the castle the cliff wall and the towers. I really think the dungeons were added on. And that very well could be. Um, but st- still, like, it's still a very, it's it's a feat um, to really get all of that information in an NES game. Another thing, one more thing that I'd like to mention in regards to the technical side of things. Um, and, and I would like to say too, like, it's almost not a thing for, any game to not have any bugs but we really only mentioned that one and i know there's one other one that has to do with like palette changes or something but i've never seen it um so there's not really many bugs to note in this game but the 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 really cool thing that they did and the thing that's really impressive if you know anything about nes architecture hardware is that the nes could only handle I think it's I think it's eight sprites. I think it's eight seven or eight sprites per scan line. So on the same vertical sorry, same uh horizontal uh line across the screen, there can only be eight eight by eight tiles that display on the screen. If there's more than that, then suddenly it becomes random as to which one is gonna display on the screen. Thus we have so many Nintendo games with the sprite flicker. That's it's it, it, there there's so many games that are plagued by the sprite flicker. This game has sprite flickering too because you can't just get away with not having sprite flickering. But their solution to the problem, I'm really surprised it did not get implemented in like other games that I that are at least not many. I haven't I haven't found any others. But their solution to this problem was 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 pretty unique. Um, if you if you run into a situation where there's where you reach this limit or you cross over this limit of number of sprites on screen, rather than just leaving it up to the hardware to figure out like which one to display or whatever, um, which usually meant there was just the one on the far, like one on the far right or the far left just wouldn't display at all. Um, and then one of the solutions that they ended up developing at some point was to just randomly display seven of them every frame. Um, this takes a whole other to a whole a whole other level, technically, where they actually decide to interlace it pixel row by pixel row. So basically, if you have like one more sprite on the screen than you should, then two of those sprites are suddenly going to become kind of transparent. And if you look at it, it's almost like they it's like looking through a screen, like every other pixel row is drawn and it's that way for, for both sprites. And that to me was amazing. I'm not sure I've ever seen that in another Nintendo game. That's pretty cool. I will say that I, I, I took notice of like some of the sprite flickering and stuff, but I didn't notice the the detail in that. That's pretty awesome. Do you have any technical issues with the game Deacon Gabor? I mean, the only other ones I, I took really note of was the fact that you basically have no iframes. Like you get hit and you lose control of your character. And then so that just puts you into a perpetual state of dying. Um, 
and then I mentioned the hit boxes being a little off. Uh, and then there's the, the one thing is like you look, you're so slow, right? Walking around the world, especially at the beginning, and you get an item that's the uh, the boots. Hyper that, boots is that what it's called? I think it, it's some yeah. Let's let's call it hyper boots. Um, so you're like, okay, great, I'm gonna run faster. You only speed up if you were walking in a diagonal motion. Yeah, that was weird. I can't help but think that's a technical bug. It makes it makes no it at least game if it's a gameplay choice, then it makes no sense. I don't understand why you would do that, and then it, otherwise it feels like a bug. Yeah, it's supposed to be helping you get up the stairs faster, but you're saying it only helps you get up the stairs faster if you're walking up them diagonally. That's right. <laughs> I, I didn't notice that when I was playing. That's really interesting. Yeah, very odd. Because you you are so slow that you're looking forward to moving faster throughout the entire world, but but that never really happens. Huh. When I realized I was like something's off. I was like I'm I'm moving fast sometimes, but not all the time and it's uh and then I realized that yeah, it's only the the cardinal directions aren't affected. Let us proclaim the hints and cheats of our game. A reading from the Deadly Towers Manual. Collecting circle hearts is the only way to increase your maximum hit points. Once you fire your sword, you cannot fire the next sword until the first sword disappears from the screen. If you are not wearing the glove to increase your sword speed, you might not be able to fight quickly enough. Enemy attacks are more powerful and exits are more difficult to find in the parallel worlds. But you may find useful items in these worlds. To find your way around the dungeons and to keep from getting lost, carefully map the dungeons and write down the locations of magical drawings and monsters. Burning a bell will allow you to recover hit points, but you can also keep it and burn it later. After you get the bell from the tower, the enemies in the tower and outside the tower may become more powerful. When you get a bell at the top of the tower and return to the underground, the entrance to the tower will disappear. A reading from the Deadly Towers manual. The, the concept that they, that they just said uh, of like, you can hold on to your bells. Uh, oh my god. I was playing the other night, I think... I think Deacon Gabora, you were watching, and I. <laughs> yeah, right. this was good. I, I had four bells, <laughs> and I walked up the, to burn one because I needed to refill my hit points. Now, keep in mind, I was only going to burn one <laughs> because because of the two uh, because of two really poor gameplay decisions. One being being thrown back. Two being the enemy sprite will ambush you from off screen and give you no chance to react. I got ambushed by the <laughs> wind and thrown into the fire. Now, you may say, what's the big deal? You were going to touch the fire anyway. Well, when the game, when the game, when you throw a bell into the fire, the game, I, I believe, and Father Avram would be able to attest to this more than I would. But when you throw the bell into the game, I believe the game literally pauses and they play music and effects and then the game starts again. So what ended up happening was since you get thrown back when you get hit, the wind threw me back and I kept moving back into the flame therefore burning every last one of my bells <laughs> with no way of, of stopping it. That's devastating. Uh, but hilarious. <laughs> yeah. There, I, so in regards to hints and cheats that there's actually, so the reading from the manual, that it's all excerpts, little, little footnotes that are collected uh, throughout the manual uh, compiled into one reading. Um, so they do give you, they, tr they tried, they, they really did try to give you, um, as much information as they could, which uh, is actually, I, I, I gotta say this it, again, not very popular in early Nintendo history. Like they didn't 
really give you a whole lot of information in manuals. Not like, not like this. Um, so that was cool. Uh, but they, they, there is another cheat. Um, Nintendo power issue three has a very, very small excerpt about, uh, deadly towers in their hints section called classified information, uh, where if you basically start a, uh, a game and then die, that brings up the password screen. And then you substitute the first two letters of that password with E F or F E. Then you get all the hyper armor and, uh, the best sword in the game. However, you also get the dreaded parallel shot. Mm. And uh, so it might make your life easier in regards to survivability, in regards to getting hit, but it is not... I do not recommend this cheat, especially in a, like, hey, I'm just starting the game. Give me all the hyper armor and the parallel shot. Like, I almost feel like that's going to be more frustrating to try to play the game that way. Um, the other thing that I was going to mention that, uh, as I mentioned earlier is that there are a couple of places, uh, uh namely um, the places I'm thinking of are the two mini bosses in the castle. Um, if you try to enter back through the room, like from, from, from the entrance that they're blocking, you're going to get hit, right? And normally you would get pushed back into the other room. However, whenever you're doing a room uh, transition, you can actually get out of that loop. Sometimes, I don't know if it's 100%, but you can some kind, sometimes get out of that, uh, that transition by, uh, by pushing diagonally in the direction you want to go as you enter the room. Hmm. So, um, because the hit mechanic in, um, in the game is based on the uh, direction you are facing, not the direction that you got hit from. So, uh, so if you can change your direction real fast, then it, I think it ends up, it, I think it throws you to like the left or the right. And then, you know, either way you don't get, you, you don't get thrown back into the other room. So that is um, something to keep in mind. (laughs) I think one thing that we need to make sure people know if they're going to play this game and we kind of mentioned it a little, a little earlier is the absolute best way to get Lutter is to go into the dungeon and find what is called a blob tower. I don't know if that's the official name of it, but that's what everybody calls it Mm -hmm. because they are for the most part, very easy to kill and are very lucrative. They they leave a lot of goodies behind for you. Uh, The only downside to that is that you're going into a dungeon. And if you die, which you probably nine out of ten times you do when you go into a dungeon, you're going to lose your money anyway. So I, if you, (laughs) it's kind of this catch 22. Well, you need the money in the beginning of the game to get the the, the basic armor from the dungeons. Mm-hmm. So it it's at least a a good starting hint. At some point, the lutter kind of loses its value as you gain hyper armor, but there are still some valuable items that you can buy from the shops. Um, so towards the end of the game, specifically, you might want to go and load up on items before you head to the last boss. I I vaguely remember being a kid and somehow finding a password. Uh, I I don't remember where I found it. Or maybe it was a fever dream. I don't know. But I I remember (laughs) getting a password where I had everything and all the bells were burned. And all I had to do was go and beat the boss. And I couldn't do it because I didn't have the blue necklace. It's very unfortunate. (laughs) Anyways, do you have any uh, passwords or stories, anecdotes you want to share with us, Deacon Gabor, about hints and cheats for Deadly Towers? I got nothing. Just find a walkthrough and enjoy it that way.
And now, brethren, let us offer each other the body of price. So the game price then, in 1988, was $35. And according to the uh, uh, CPI inflation calculator, $35 in 1988 is worth $92.88 today. That's pretty crazy. That is. <laughs> yeah, that's that's some inflation right there. Uh, so what does the price of Deadly Towers look like? today to actually achieve a or acquire a physical copy a loose copy this is all uh by the way i should mention all these prices are according to pricecharting.com uh, a loose copy is uh, roughly seven dollars and 32 cents uh the box only is twenty dollars and fifty cents manual only is eight dollars and sixty three cents complete that means, you know, in box with the manual and a loose copy, $40.50. And then a brand new sealed copy is $294.66. I started collecting complete copies of games uh, within the past few years. And $40 for a complete game is nothing. It, it's literally nothing comparatively. Yeah. Yeah, this game is definitely on the low end of price points for uh, collecting NES games. Especially given the last few years on how much it's risen. Like the, this, uh, a $7 game is unheard of. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's probably fair to mention that pricecharting.com bases its prices, I believe, totally on online sales. So like if you can't, you can't expect to go into a retro video game store and get even a loose copy of this for seven dollars and 32 cents it's going to cost you a little bit more than that yeah i was at one today and i saw a couple copies of deadly towers and and they were eight dollars oh really All right, yeah that's about right that's then. actually not bad yeah because i i i was expecting more along the lines of 10 or 12 but nope very cool Let us now execute judgment upon Deadly Towers and decide which of the seven cardinal sins it has committed. Father Avram, in regards to narrative, what is your final judgment? In regards to narrative, Deadly Towers has committed no fault. Deacon Gabor, in regards to narrative, what is your final judgment? In regards to narrative, Deadly Towers has committed no fault. In regards to narrative and the presence of this assembly, Deadly Towers has been spared. Father Avram, in regards to audio, what is your final judgment? In regards to audio, Deadly Towers has committed a most heinous cardinal sin. Deacon Gabor, in regards to audio, what is your final judgment? In regards to audio, Deadly Towers has committed a most heinous cardinal sin. In regards to audio and the presence of this assembly, Deadly Towers has committed a loathsome cardinal sin deserving of hellfire and damnation. <laughs> Father Avram, in regards to gameplay, what is your final judgment? In regards to gameplay, Deadly Towers has committed a most heinous cardinal sin. Deacon Gabor, in regards to gameplay... What is your final judgment? In regards to gameplay, Deadly Towers has committed a most heinous cardinal sin. In regards to gameplay, and in the presence of this assembly, Deadly Towers has committed a loathsome cardinal sin deserving of hellfire and damnation once again. <laughs> Father Avram, in regards to graphics, what is your final judgment? In regards to graphics, Deadly Towers has committed a most heinous cardinal sin. Deacon Gabor, in regards to graphics, what is your final judgment? In regards to graphics, Deadly Towers has committed no fault. In regards to graphics and in the presence of this assembly, Deadly Towers has been spared. Father Avram, in regards to the box art, what is your final judgment? 
In regards to box art and presentation, Deadly Towers has committed no fault. Deacon Gabor. In regards to box art and presentation, what is your final judgment? In regards to box art and presentation, Deadly Towers has committed no fault. In regards to box art and presentation, and in the presence of this assembly, Deadly Towers has been spared. Father Ravram, in regards to fun factor, what is your final judgment? In regards to fun factor, Deadly Towers has committed a most heinous cardinal sin. Deacon Gabor, in regards to fun factor, what is your final judgment? In regards to fun factor, Deadly Towers has committed no fault. In regards to fun factor and in the presence of this assembly, Deadly Towers has committed a loathsome cardinal sin deserving of hellfire and damnation. Father Averman, in regards to technical, what is your final judgment? In regards to technical, Deadly Towers has committed no fault. Deacon Gabor, in regards to technical, what is your final judgment? In regards to technical, Deadly Towers has committed a most heinous cardinal sin. In regards to technical and in the presence of this assembly, Deadly Towers has committed a loathsome cardinal sin deserving of hellfire and damnation. Deadly Towers, by the authority invested in me, I'd execute judgment upon you, having committed four cardinal sins in the categories of audio, gameplay, fun factor, and technical, for which there can be no forgiveness, no mercy, no redemption. We exile you to the bowels of hell. This concludes this evening's service. Remember, our liturgy does not simply come to an end. Those assembled are sent forth to bring the fruits of the ministry to the world.